This is RCN Magazine Audio. Inspiration and information for nurses, nursing support workers and nursing students. This is a content warning. Please note, this audio contains discussions of suicide and mental illness, which some people may find distressing. You know, when you're thinking about your shopping, you think, oh, I need to get some bread, and I need to get some milk, and da-da-da. No, I wonder if that building's high enough. And it hadn't even crossed my mind that that was an option. And it terrified me that just as part of a completely normal thought, there is that suicidal thought. Hello, my name's Shelley, and I'm a nurse on the South Coast. Hello, my name is Liz, and I'm also a nurse on the South Coast. So I think if we talked about suicidal ideation and what it means to people, I I personally don't think you can define it in one straightforward way because it means something different to different people. And what it might mean to me may be completely, not necessarily misinterpreted, but interpreted very differently by somebody else. I'd agree with that. Because having suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation or a suicidal... Um, fleeting thought is not the same as having a plan. Yeah. But if you don't speak about that with somebody and it becomes something you ruminate on, it then becomes... Then it, yeah, it's a bit more worrying. becomes what you're doing and who you are and yeah. that can then not be separated out. And I think that's sometimes where the overlap can come. No, I agree with that. So... I've experienced um, poor mental health at different points in my life, so I approach it in different ways. So when I was younger, I engaged in self-harm, I was a bit of a goth kid, I had a bit of a attitude, I was, you know, quite oppositional. I'd like to say I grew out of it, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> no comment. Um, and I, you know, it was a phase, it was seen as very mm. much that, and it was something that I struggled with that was never really addressed. It was just, you don't do that, that's not appropriate. You learn right from wrong, you grow up in inverted commas, you learn different ways of coping. Basically, I got old enough to buy a beer, that's what happened. And then you suppressed those thoughts, mm. and you shared thoughts that people shared with you. And you realise some people don't talk about this sort of thing. So you don't. And you Mm. don't bring it up until it's in natural parlance. Then when I did... um, Well, the next time I had similar thoughts was when I was a couple of weeks into being a new mum. Everybody gets the baby blues. Not everybody gets postnatal depression. I didn't have postnatal depression, but it was the first time I'd suddenly thought, oh, all those things I thought when I was 15 and I thought I knew everything about everything in the world. Maybe I was right. This is actually a thought process and with thoughts come actions. And just because I think it doesn't mean, you know, I think therefore I am doesn't necessarily mean that everything you think you have to do. And the last thing I wanted to do was pray the child off the roof. But when I spoke to my mum and she was like, well, everybody feels like that with a baby when they haven't slept. Give me the baby, go to bed. And it became something that you suddenly were like, oh, other people do feel like this sometimes. We just don't talk about it. Mm. It's one of those things. It's a taboo. And then I did my training prior to doing my training I was working in forensics I was working in mental health and it was something that other people often explained as it's something that happens to other people it's not something that happens to everybody but I learned very quickly that I could relate to the patients because I treated them as a human being because it's all part of the human experience it's just that their circumstances and their actions were different to mine but we've all been there wherever there is It's just how easy you can talk yourself back from those feelings or what support you've got in place. That's what differs. Then as I experienced burning out at work and becoming overwhelmed with feelings, I suddenly realised there was a very thin gap between the people I was there to help and becoming a patient. Mm. And being on both sides of the fence at the same time is a really difficult place to be. So for me... The crossover, if you like, wasn't the having thoughts. It was the having thoughts and knowing all of the things to be able to coach somebody else and trying to do that to myself, but knowing it wasn't enough. 
and feeling unsafe and then being like, what would I advise someone else to do? Well, I'd tell them to go to A&E if they don't feel safe. I think that's a really good point. For me, kind of similarly to Shelley, um, again, all my life I've had ups and downs with mental health. But what frightened me one time was I, I, I had gone off sick from work and I was feeling quite... I didn't realise, I, I, I assumed I felt quite low and depressed. But we were talking about disassociation earlier. And um, in actual fact, I just felt completely at disconnect with everything around me. Not frightened of it, not scared of it. I just, it was like my own little world and maybe I was a ghost type. No mm. one can actually see me. Which didn't particularly bother me because it actually felt quite nice to not have to interact But I'd gone into a local shopping precinct. Don't even remember what I'd gone there for, probably just to mooch something to do. And, um, you know, when you're thinking about your shopping, you think, oh, I need to get some bread and I need to get some milk and da-da-da. No, I wonder if that building's high enough. And it hadn't even crossed my mind that that was an option. And it terrified me that just as part of a completely normal thought, there is that suicidal thought. And I just went, okay, I went straight down to the sur- GP surgery. And I walked in and said, I need to see a doctor, quite promptly. But because it was such a normal thought, it scared me because I thought, what if I had in my disassociative mood just gone up there to find out? So I went to the doctors because I thought, I don't actually want to take my life. But that frightened me that it was no different to me as saying, oh, I could do with getting some bread, actually. That it was just there. But yeah, so that frightened me. That was very much a kind of, oh, crumbs, that, where did that come from? I wasn't aware that I felt that way. And I had a lot of therapy and I got better slowly. And I w- went back to work and all the rest of it. And then I think, you know, COVID did not help at all I was working in in critical care at the time and that was that was really hard similar to yourself the reason that I booked into (coughs) AP was twofold it was the sense that my thought process had changed and I couldn't see a a way forward Mm. I couldn't future plan and I couldn't see what to do next so I was at that point of view where I was like for the sake of myself, I don't want to put my colleagues through a situation where I'm in recess GCS3 and they're calling ITU and trying to do all the things because somebody's found me. I don't want to put anybody through that, so I'm going to be sensible and book in under my own steam and say I need somebody else to take the wheel and drive because if I'm left to my own devices, I know too many things and I will not be here mm. tomorrow. So I'm going to sit here and I will wait. And that's what I did. But I still can't believe I did it. Mm. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> I know you're in a much better place now. Because obviously we wouldn't be having this conversation if either of us well, hadn't got better. But what did? What was the main thing you learned from from that? If we just say that specific experience as opposed to other ones in your life. So from that specific experience, I think the biggest thing I learned about myself was how much agency I do actually have in my own life. But also understanding more about burnout and compassion fatigue and and the weight of the emotional labour of what we do as nurses and how, for me, being able to have a very simple, reflective conversation with somebody on a regular basis, even if it is to go, is it just me or is that person really hard work? is so protective and it's actually what I need as a human being not just in my work role but to be able to just offload that share it and move on rather than have to almost self-deprecate yourself first before other people say something oh yeah or be in a position where you're like "Well, well nobody cares what I do I'm not important and those self-critical thoughts taking over but actually being able to sort of step back and go well, actually, there is more than one way of looking at this and I don't have to go with my first instinct, which is hard because as nurses, particularly in A&E, mm, you the one do. you live on your instincts. 
I learned so much about myself and how many things that other people say to you, you know, you are, you are worth it. Everything sounds really cliche, but cliches are a cliche for a reason because they are universal truths. I know what I think maybe maybe the risks and things or the heightened risks, but what do you, what do you think are the main reasons why nurses might fall by the wayside and take their own lives and do? I think it's a very difficult thing to define because every single person's experience is going to be completely different. Yeah. And I think it would be dangerous to suggest that there are certain jobs within nursing that are more risky than others, e.g. A and E. Because everywhere you. you're looking after people, you've got that emotional labour, you haven't got staff, you haven't got yeah. supervision, that's happening everywhere. I mean, in certain areas you are much more exposed to certain things, so in A and E. Yeah. But then, you know, I've been doing this for 27 and a half years, and I've seen such changes. So I get frustrated with with the government, with 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 managers, with policies, with procedures, with staffing, with pay... But, you know, putting my logical head on, there's been an, such a massive cut to mental health services. Huge. And I think there's a lot, there's prob- probably, I'm not speaking with authority, but there is probably a lot of sort of societal and cultural expectations. And a lot of stigma. And a lot of stigma. There's so many people that... We still see it as a crime. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Then they are to seek out because they don't want to be seen in that light. No, exactly. And like you say, people still say commit suicide. It's not a crime. And there's also the aspect of it's everything altogether. So it's bigger than it's almost coming away from the individual experience or the professional experience or the healthcare experience. But going, what is the culture we've created here? What have we made normal? would be your key message to somebody who is out there struggling what would you say to them slightly difficult one to answer because it all depends on who when where why and how and the context because of that one size does not feel fit all but i would certainly avoid saying things like oh i know how you feel so there's things to avoid in my book, like, what would I, what would I hate to hear? But again, it's not one size fit all. Mm. So if somebody started to tell you that you know they're they're having a really difficult time at home, their long term partner has just walked out of the out on them out of the blue, leaving them with two young children, taken the dog, worried worried about how to make ends meet, blah blah blah. So I don't mean blah 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 as in you know, belittling it, but quite a complex thing, then I think, and this could, this can also be advised to leaders and the person that that person's gone to as well, is that I would like to think that I would start by saying something kind, like, oh my goodness, that does sound like you're going through a very, very difficult time. How are you feeling right now? Would you like to talk about this now? Or would you like to just maybe we can have a cup of tea and a biscuit and see how you feel? And not to force them to talk. Oh, you come to me. I'm I'm a band six. Talk to me because I can fix you. It's really important in my mind to not make promises. To not say, we can fix this, but to listen much more than you talk and to validate what that person is saying. I don't know how you feel because I've not experienced all of those things at once. And even if I had, I still don't know how you feel because I'm not you. But I hear you and I'm really sorry that you're going through such a difficult time. How do you want to manage this? And how can I help you, if at all, 
What do you need from me? And then listen. And if they don't know, then say, well, for example, but you could get some support from occupational health. They may not, they may think, oh my God, that's in it. And then you can explain, actually, they're really good. Um, there are some support networks out there. I won't tell you all about them now because you may not be in the right frame of mind, but maybe in a couple of days, if you like, I could email them to you so that they can read them in their own time rather than going, right, let's fix this. You need this. You need that. And I know what you mean because I shut up. You don't. They've come to talk to you. Listen. And then if I was giving, listening to that person just to just say, you know, I'm very sorry that you're feeling this way. It must be awful. I can see you're distressed. What would you like to do right now? I need to go home. I think you're probably right. Would it be okay if we just sat down and had a cup of tea first? Because I'm concerned about you. And I just want to make you're sure you're okay. That was one of the things when I had an altercation at work before I went off sick. Where I went home in tears on the bus. And the thing I noticed with my new manager was she'll ask things like, so how are you getting home? Yeah. As, a parent, as opposed to, yeah, fine, leave the room. It's... But as a human being, mm. you had that obligation to continue the care. Mm. And one of the things I would say to somebody who is struggling with thoughts is you don't have to act on a thought. A thought, however intrusive, is still a thought. Tell someone. Do not keep your thoughts to yourself. Do not let yourself ruminate over an event. If it's a situation at work following an incident, ensure you understand how you can access support. It might be that a group of you need a formal debrief. Sometimes we just need to get it all off our chest or to cry or vent. And remember, you can always call the Samaritans. They're always there. They always listen anytime. Asking for help is never easy. But identifying that there is an issue and seeking support is the best thing you can do for yourself. to nursing colleagues if someone comes to you and they're struggling I would say simply hold space for them and listen ask them directly if they've made a plan this will not put the idea into their head as many fear this but it may well save their life if they came to you they trust you and look into um, becoming a mental health first aider um, a lot of um, trusts do that as a um, course that people can go on um, and they use an acronym that can be used in this situation. So as if you're a manager and it's something that you know that you've got people that you have that work under you, that is your role to to provide pastoral support, for want of a better way of putting it. And it comes into a little acronym called ALGI, which amuses me because it's the green slime. stuff that's... Yeah, it's <laughs> slime, isn't it? So A is for approach. So assess for the risk of suicide or harm. Try to find a suitable time or place to start the conversation in the corridor, in the handover room is probably not it. You need somewhere appropriate. Um, if the person does not want to confide in you, encourage them to talk to someone they trust. So then it's L, listen non-judgmentally. Most people experiencing a challenge or distress want to be heard first. So just let them speak, let them let it all out without interrupting them. Try and have empathy for their situation. You get the conversation started by something like, I noticed you're not yourself today. Mm. Something going on. Um, G, give reassurance and information. After someone shared their experiences and emotions with you, be ready to provide hope and useful facts. E, encourage appropriate professional help. The earlier someone gets help, the better their chances of recovery. So it's important to offer this person some help and to know what the available options are. So if you are in a managerial role, understand what the policies and procedures are about the employment. Um, Definitely. And then the final E is encourage self-help and support strategies. Don't ask someone to start knitting. But if they, if there is something that people like to do, um, you know, encourage them to find their people. So if somebody likes to go for a run when they're stressed, perhaps go to park run, run with other people. There'll probably be lots of people angry running. 
find somebody to angry around with. Usually the one that goes the quickest going. <laughs> um, this then enables them to find their people and find that support network, which then means they can then sit and write an, uh, an emotional and physical self-care plan. Most suicidal ideation doesn't result in action and most people with the right support and help can live full and productive lives and it doesn't impact on their mental well-being for the entirety of their career and it's very important that we think about the fact that we have normalized such poor terms and conditions in our profession that some of our student nurses don't even qualify that we've got people that are working in situations where they're working all the hours they can get and they're under immense pressure without the staffing required, that actually that is going to take its toll. And as a profession, we can't just say, oh, well, toughen up, little it. soldier. They couldn't hack it. And that they're individually culpable for that. They're culpable for their actions, but are inaction collectively to allow those situations to propagate and to repeat because you'll find most situations are very similar. The things that have happened in that person's last year probably do correlate and can be shared. So therefore, I think there's a lot that could be done about culture and workplaces. Definitely. Particularly Social being... media doesn't help either. Mm. I'm really glad I didn't ever act. But I do accept and understand that that isn't going to be the case for everybody support them, do your mental health first aid. But there will always be someone who never talks about it, that nobody ever knew that they felt like that. So all I would say to that is never, ever, ever, ever feel even remotely responsible because it wasn't you that killed them. It was their own mind, if you like. So don't ever feel guilty if somebody takes their life because you didn't cause that to happen. If you're going through a tough time or having thoughts of suicide, it's important you tell someone. Call the Samaritans on 116 123 or visit samaritans.org. Please try to stay safe until you can speak to someone about how you feel. If you're an RCN member, you can receive mental health support via our free counselling service by calling 0345 772 6100 or get advice from RCN Direct on the same number. For more related resources, and details of this audio interview, visit rcn.org.uk slash magazine. Find more RCN Magazine content at rcn.org.uk slash magazine. Brought to you by the Royal College of Nursing.